What's up, guys? I am Jamie Bettingfield, and you are listening to my podcast, Too Many Words. Thanks for tuning in. This is the last episode of 2017, and I am here with author Mike Cole. Welcome back, Mike. (laughs) Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm getting you right in the middle of uh, two releases. You had um, Siege Line that came out in October, and you have The Armored Saint coming out in February. Yeah, that's right. It's uh, Siege Line is closing out my military fantasy run, six novels with Ace Rock, the uh, the Shadow Ops trilogy. And then I actually, I guess I did it backwards, is that the prequel trilogy, which are the books you should read before Shadow Ops, I then published next. And uh, that's Gemini, Cell, Javelin, Rain, and Siege Line just came out on Halloween. And then in February, I launched The Armored Saint, which will be my first dark medieval fantasy coming from tour.com really excited about that i am really excited about this and the cover is gorgeous yeah i'm really really excited about the cover and it's actually funny because with the ace rock books i had i don't i think i talked about this the last time i was on the show i had unprecedented control over my cover i don't know how much your listeners know about how covers work in science fiction and fantasy most um publishers will solicit an author's opinion But nine times out of 10, they'll get your opinion and then be like, yeah, that's nice. You're getting this and they'll give them what they want. Uh, But because my covers had so much military hardware in them that the uh, publisher felt that they really wanted to get accurately, I had a lot of input up until the point where in the last three books, I was practically my own art director. And when I went and started publishing with Tor.com, I had, I was spoiled, right? I had this assumption that I was going to, you know, have this level of influence in my covers. And I tried to do that with Irene Gallo, who is the um, the boss over at Tor.com and also a major art director. And she sort of, you know, took my inputs and nodded nicely and turned around and gave me a cover, which was totally different and way better than anything I could have imagined. So, um, you know, sometimes it's good not to have control. Yeah. Although it's hard to relinquish control. Man, no, especially especially when you're a writer, right? We're all, uh, well, at least the people I hang with and myself, we're all pretty much control freaks. Yeah, I, I can't say that I've met a writer that isn't a control freak. Well, I mean, it makes sense, right? We're creating our own worlds and uh, we're used to being able to, you know, everything from the weather to the actions of the characters to the flora and fauna, it's all us. Yeah. And then, right. And the thing is also when you publish a novel, it's your name on it. And there's a tendency that, for people who are outside the industry to believe, well, it's your book. But the truth is, is that when you're working at least with a publisher, it's a massive group effort. You have editors and copywriters and copy editors and proofreaders and art directors and marketing people and publicity people and agents, all of these people who are involved in making a book. A book is a a massive project with a lot of inputs that um, that in in a way it's kind of selfish because only one person's name goes on it in the end. Yeah, it really does take a village. And it's definitely that is something that I did not realize very early on. And now it's, you know, it's, it's abundantly clear that it it takes a whole team to get something out there. Yeah, even if you're self publishing, I would argue, because if you're self publishing, there's a whole IT infrastructure that you're having a lease, right, or Kindle or Kindle Direct, let's say, and all of those people who are staffed, and any smart self-publisher is going to probably hire an independent editor. Oh, yeah. And hire, right. They're going to pay artists. They're going to maybe get art, hire outside art direction. They're just going to wind up contracting a lot of the services that are in-house at a publisher. At least all the real yeah. successful self-publishers I talk to do that. Oh, yeah, totally. And even um, back when I was doing that, you know, you would farm out some stuff for like, you know, tours and, you know, get a ha- getting a hand here and, and that sort of thing. Um, all that though was you know it, that part of it wasn't for me so I'm you know headed the different way but yeah same thing same thing for me a lot of people ask that why don't you self publish and my and I look I I definitely I acknowledge that self publishing is a totally legit way to produce great writing and make a living I I do think that the lack of curation does make the signal the noise ratio a little worse but the um the fact is there's a lot of great self published stuff out there and there's a lot of writers who are a hundred times more successful than I'll ever be that are out there as self-published writers. My thing is that I don't want to be my own publisher. Yeah. I don't want to do all that work. I just want to write a book and hand it to someone else and then have them handle all that work. That's the real difference. Yeah, no, same here. I mean, as it is, I 
try to like, you know, work really hard so my brain doesn't explode. So all that other extra stuff. And it's just, I'm a complete, I'd be a complete cartoon character all the time. I think it's also a different set of skills, right? Being just because you can write a book doesn't mean that you'd necessarily be good at cover design or marketing or, or, or even something like copy editing. Mm -hmm. They they really are like, you know, or being the kind of entrepreneurial person to make that business run. You know, I, I just feel like it's totally different skill sets. Totally. Yeah. And even as far as like promoting a book, it's completely different, or at least for me, it feels completely different than promoting the podcast. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So do you do New Year's resolutions? <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> um, uh, absolutely not. And And by the way, I'm really glad to be sending the podcast out in 2017 because man, what a year. Oh. I'm so happy to see this year in my rearview mirror. So I'm, so let's, you know, let's grind our boot heel on the throat of 2017 again. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> I, I look at New Year's resolutions the same way I look at NaNoWriMo. Um, I, I often make fun of people doing NaNoWriMo. Anyone who follows me on Twitter will see me, you know, kind of gently bashing <laughs> NaNoWriMo people. And I, I'm glad I have a chance to speak to that here because the truth is, is I'm, I'm anything that gets people writing. And anything that builds a sense of community that helps to encourage people to pursue their dreams of, of, of producing writing is to be lauded and is a, is a good thing. So the truth is I don't hate NaNoWriMo. What kind of chaps me a little bit about NaNoWriMo is it's the idea that writing is a thing that's done in a single month, right? Um, and I understand that, that NaNoWriMo purists would say, well, no, if this is just we write all year round, but this is just one year where we really celebrate it and get on the stick. Um, and I get it. I totally do. But it's the same thing with New Year's resolutions, is that these kinds of like sudden grand gestures that happen in a burst, right? So anyone who goes to a gym knows that January 2nd, you go to the gym and it's super crowded and you can't get on any of the equipment because there's all these people you've never seen before that are in there. And, you know, you turn to your your friends that you work out with regularly and you go, oh, man, it's so crowded in here. And they turn to you and they go, don't worry, wait a week. 90% of them will be gone. (laughs) And unfortunately, it's true. And it it makes me sad because I'd love to see people making a real commitment. I know what being committed to health and fitness and, and how great that's been in my own life. And I'd love to see everybody doing it. But I also know just from life experience that when you make these kinds of grand, sudden commitments, it's a lot diff- more difficult to stick. And it's the same thing with NaNoWriMo is that I, I, I much prefer people to make these kinds of slow, gradual, incremental, but more long lasting commitments. You know, not that I'm going to do a burst and and try to grind out 50,000 words in a single month, but that I'm going to get, you know, 100 words or 200 words or whatever every single night, no matter what, like brushing my teeth, or I'm going to meet weekly goals. And I'm going to commit to doing this, you know, not not for one month or two months or five months, but for always. And I find that that kind of like really a lot more gentle, a lot less dramatic and a lot more long lasting commitment both in, in writing and in almost anything else, has a tendency to stick and, and, at least in my own experience, produce much better results. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely, um, I can see that. So it, it's interesting that you brought up NaNoWriMo. I participated in it this year. And I, I use the momentum of like, you know, people doing it to kind of get over the hump of, because I had to do this rewrite. I've known that I've had to do it and I've been intimidated by it because I spent my summer just chewing out scenes that I didn't need. So it did it, it, you know, and I'm, I'm still working on it, but it got, it got me, I used it kind of like as an excuse to get on the ball with it. Yeah. And I think, and that's fantastic. And that's great use of it. And I, and I'm actually, like I said, I'm really glad I got a chance to kind of explain myself since I'm so, since I'm, I'm good naturedly, but you know, my, my sense of humor on Twitter can be a little dark, <laughs> but, um, there are lots of writers out there who have successful published novels with big New York publishing houses that started as NaNoWriMo novels. I know for sure that Mary Robinette Kowal is one of them. I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head, but I know there are other writers that um, that wound up taking their NaNoWriMo novels. Those NaNoWriMo novels were the core of what, you know, because 50,000 words is not a, a saleable novel. They were, you know, oh, yeah. uh, you know not pet. Well, and writing yeah. anything and that, you know, when you're churning out a lot of words, those words, you know, at least for me, the more words I churn out in a day, those edits, you know, they're there. They need to happen. 
Um, right, for sure. <laughs> so there's that part of it too, is I think there's, you know, a lot of people will go ahead and push these words out in, you know, November and then kind of try to pitch that. And it's far from ready. Yeah. And actually one of the, um, I jokingly tweeted one day, uh, I actually I tweeted on December the 1st. I said, it's December the 1st, put down your pencils, close your laptops. You may no longer write novels. <laughs> and uh, everyone had a good laugh at that. But what was interesting was a lot of the follow-up tweets I got, which I think you'll find encouraging were, that's right. Now it's nano edit mode, you know? Yeah. Um, right. And so people were, people are thinking about that, I think. And I do think that um, maybe because of the prevalence of social media and the the close communication between aspiring writers and professional writers now, there's a lot of tradecraft that's starting to kind of work its way out into the community. And, and people know that that polish, polish, polish is a really important piece of what it takes to make a great novel. Yes. Yeah. As far as New Year's resolutions, I don't partake in them. I don't like, you know, I but, but you made a few. Well, oh, I've definitely made a few. Um, <laughs> you know, especially like when I was younger and like wanted this grand change, it'd be like, oh, starting January, I am, you know, not going to smoke cigarettes anymore. How'd that go? Oh, not well. <laughs> it would be generous to say I made it 13 days. But okay. I, well, that's something. But I do like the, I don't know, there's like a, romanticized element to new year's resolutions that i do like there's a wonder there that i get a kick out of and yeah there's probably 90 percent, 95 percent of people who start the year with a resolution don't finish it but there's probably some that do and i don't know i like that i'm feeling up i do today <laughs> yeah i mean i like that too and i think that it speaks to a bigger issue and it's the same issue i think with a lot of people uh, what draws people to writing or, or creating of any art, I think, is that people, I think a lot of people aren't 100% thrilled with where they are in their life. Yeah. And they want, and they want it to change. And um, change can be really hard. And that's one of the things I think that draws us to fantasy and science fiction is this idea that, you know, change can come suddenly and it can come dramatically. You know, a, a starship can land on your lawn and someone can get out and say, you know, hey, you know, don't ask any questions, get in. And all of a sudden, everything will be different. Um, I think the New Year's resolution has like a wishing upon a star quality to it. Yeah. And if, if you do it at midnight and you really believe this thing that you want to change about yourself, it will change. Um, and I think uh, there's a little ingredient of hope in that. And hope's never a bad thing. So the only reason I'm such a killjoy... <laughs> So I never get invited to parties um, about stuff like that. It's just that, you know, I really do want people to be successful. And, and my experience with real change is that it, it's never the grand gesture. It's always the slow grind. Oh. And then you sort of, you look up one day, you know, after years and years and years of churning away at this thing that you thought was useless and you're, and you're like, holy shit, uh, you know, this, this happened. Oh, hey, Jamie, let me give you my own example. Okay. My writing, my writing career, my writing career, it took me fifth years, 15 years of nights and weekends writing and writing and writing. I chucked four whole books before I finally got one that got a book deal that, that was good enough to sell, that got the agent and that made it through. So man, that is the exact opposite of a grand gesture. Yeah. And I know that um, uh, Charlene Harris, who wrote the Suki Stackhouse novels that became the True Blood TV show. Oh, yeah. She's one of my agency mates. We're represented both by Joshua Bilm as a Jabberwocky, the same age. So I know her and, and know her story. And she had been writing um, mysteries and some paranormal stuff for 25 years before True Blood got picked up and she became the, you know, the major, major sledgehammer of a writer that she is today. And I know that Joshua and other people around the office joke around that Charlene was a 25-year overnight success. <laughs> And, you know, you hear about this stuff. I know that I think it was Jim Butcher was six novels before he took off. Um, I believe Victoria Schwab was something like six years before she became the New York Times bestselling author that she is today. So I just feel like for a lot of people, it's just grind, 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 grind. And then one day you look up and you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, uh, you know. And then, of course, you know, there's Patrick Rothfuss, first novel out of the gate, is uh, changing the face of fantasy. <laughs> And that's, look, that's great. That's great. But you never want to count on that. Totally. I mean, there is always those cases. But yeah, no, it is a grind. 
And uh, yeah, it, it's true because you start, it's a very gradual thing and you start to look around and you're like, oh, these pieces are actually coming together. Yeah, they sure are. Hey, I, I want to follow up one thing on what I said. Uh, Patrick Rothfuss' first novel was a huge success, but I don't want that to not, I don't want that to confuse re, uh, listeners. The man is, was working for years to get that, to get to that first novel. Uh, I, that's what I meant. I didn't, I didn't want people to think he just sort of like sneezed and the name of the wind came out. Oh, well, the name of the wind, you read that and you can just feel the epic, a heart wrenching project that it was. I mean, that is yeah. that book. That's a monumental work. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Just take a minute to think about that. He's a truly great writer. Hey, you know what? You're pretty awesome yourself. Oh. Sorry if I was a little blurry sounded there. I was lifting my cat up over the microphone. <laughs> No problem. I have, uh, my cat is, uh, her back is to me and that makes me feel remotely safe. I don't know if your listeners have ever seen the uh, Pink Panther, the old Pink Panther movies with Peter Sellers. Uh, he lived with this assassin um, uh, who was trained to attack him when he least expected it. Uh, he actually wanted this because it would keep him on his toes. And that's what living with this cat is like, except I don't want it. And so every, you know, I sort of have to keep an eye on her wherever I am in the room lest she come flying out of left field and take my eye out or something. That's funny. It's funny. It's funny until you're in the hospital with a pastorella infection. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I have uh, my dog. Jake is my, my escort around the house, wherever I go. He's right there with me, making sure that, you know, everything is, is safe and squared away and we're on schedule. Cool. Yeah. I'm very jealous. <laughs> Are you a dog lover? Oh my God, such a dog lover as well as a cat lover. This cat I have because I um, I, I wanted to do something nice. Uh, when I finally had to hang it up with the Coast Guard because I just didn't have time, I, you know, I was trying to think of what else I could do to help. Um, I kind of have a, a service gene, I guess. And so my downstairs neighbor um, deals with overflow feral cats from shelters. So she was like, just take the problem cats that no one else will take because you know you're a you're a you can put up with being scratched or whatever. So I, I started taking these really, really nasty cats. And um, this one, and I would try to rehome them, of course. But I tried to rehome her. But, you know, she attacks people, so no one's going to keep her. So I, I rehomed her twice, and they gave her back after she, oh, you know, you know, like slashed someone's tires or something. And finally, the shelter goes, all right, well, you know, it's been a year, man. You, you got to either give her back or adopt her. And I was like, well, what happens if I give her back? And they were like, well, we're going to kill her. Oh, my God. And I was like, well, fuck you. I guess I'm keeping her then, aren't I, you bastard? So now I'm stuck with this animal. Oh, man. And she, and she's young. So I will be in this abusive, vicious relationship for, for many years to come. And that, I guess that and the fact that I'm never home as well, I'll never get a dog because uh, she'll kill anything that comes in sight. It's a, it's a miracle I've survived this long. Oh, man. <laughs> really great. Oh, there she is. You hear that? Okay, so she has hyperesthesia, which is a neurological disorder among cats, and she gets into these violent fights with her own tail. Oh no! And it's not—it's not playful. Like she's, she believes her tail to be an enemy, and that's why you hear her snarling in the background because she's going after it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got an eye on her. I got an eye on her. If she draws blood or something, I'll get involved. Well, that's really awesome, though. That you know, even though you're a little terrified of her, that you—you you know—you got her back. I swear to God, Jamie, my life, my life has not made, my life has never really made sense. And it only gets weirder with each passing day. And this cat is like this real dose of the surreal. That's funny. You know, it's, I'm um, sorry, my voice is cracking. I've been uh, fighting a cold. It's actually getting like frosty in Seattle. So like, you know, the sweatshirt is not cutting it as much. Are you going to be at um, Emerald City? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. I'm getting really excited for that. Uh, but Seattle will be much better in March, I, I, I guess. But uh, that remains, Seattle remains one of my favorite cities and um, Emerald City remains one of my favorite cons. I'm really excited to come out for That's it. That's awesome. No, I, I, March is a beautiful time of year here. It's pretty warm, and but you get the rain and then you get these bursts of like sunshine and daffodils are already blooming. It's, as you can tell, I love my city. So yeah, Seattle. Seattle is one of the great cities, and I have a great relationship with your police department there. And whenever I come out, I always go um, and try to visit with the Microsoft Digital Crimes Unit in Redmond, which is one of these amazing electronic crimes. It's private sector, of course, but they just do such incredible work. And um, other science fiction and fantasy writers live out there who I get to see, like Django Wexler and Jason Huff, 
when I get to uh, meet up with those guys and go gaming. And it's always great to come out to Seattle. I'm really excited. Nice. Speaking of gaming, I've been um, really wanting to start up a D&D campaign. It's been too long for me and I've been getting the itch. Not that I have the time, but I really just feel like it's nece- necessary. Yeah, it's funny. Um, uh, so there's a great con in Madison, Wisconsin, that's held, I believe, in October um, called uh, Game Hole. And it's run by this guy, Alex Kammer, out there. And he's managed to link up with all of Gary Gygax's inner circle from the old TSR days. Guys like Dave Zeb Cook and Steve Winter, the original guys who wrote first edition D&D um, and who are stayed in, you know, many of whom are still with Wizards of the Coast and some who have gone on to other companies. And it's about three, 4,000 people. It's a role-playing heavy convention. And uh, it really is sort of a walk down nostalgia lane to our early D&D, D&D days. And I went out there with Pat Rothfuss and Peter Brett. You get, you get in the soundtrack in the background of this like <laughs> lunatic cat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is so funny. But it's this incredible convention and um, everybody is super into role playing. There's plenty of tabletop board gaming there too. But uh, you really get to to uh, to be with enthusiastic role players who are out there. And I played 5e while I was out there. They run True Dungeon, which is the live action uh, dungeon while you're out there. And uh, it really got me the bug. And I was like, man, I, I want to play Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I want to play D&D. And I have the same problem you do is I come back here and like, <laughs> who has time for that? And, uh, you know, where would I find people to play with? Uh, I mean, it, wonderful thing about New York City is there's meetups you can you can sign up for and I even did one to play, play a couple of games, but, but in the end, you know, this is the thing that writing is a really, really demanding discipline. And I have just about enough time to police New York and to write and to, you know, do some stuff like this, but basically uh, that's it. There's, it doesn't leave a lot of time for leisure. Totally. Well, and also too, I mean, there's a, there's definitely heavy similarities there between like world building and playing D and D. I mean, there's some common links there as far as like the part of the brain you're using. So like, I'll- yeah, it's an important muscle to flex. Sure. You know, right now my work in prog- progress is high fantasy adventure. So just like looking at D and D maps and just thinking about moving characters through spaces like that. Definitely. My mind goes there. I mean, there's a lot of, I think the thing that, um, and I've said this in other interviews, the thing that D and D really taught me, especially being a, a DM is how to make your plot lines bulletproof because no one likes to break something like role players, right? You have this really thoughtful, carefully planned out campaign and then your players come in and they just don't go where you told them to go and don't do what you want them to do and everything's derailed and you have to tap dance to come up with new storylines. You know, or you have this character who's supposed to lead them on an adventure and they walk in a room and kill it, right? Um, And uh, everything just gets derailed. And what that does is that as you plot your novels, when you tell stories, you understand that science fiction and fantasy readers are, you know, they're truculent. They don't want to do what you want them to do. They, and you have to, be, you have to be smart enough that your plot lines, that your story is ironclad enough that it's going to hold up to that kind of scrutiny. They're going to pick apart your magic system. They're going to pick apart your character's motivations. They're going to pick apart every little detail of what you do. And you have to be ready for it. That is one way that I think d d especially being a dungeon master, really kind of trained me to be a writer. Oh, definitely. Big time. You got to prepare for those problem players. That's for sure. And I hope your kids uh, at some point get old enough that you guys can play together. That would be really wonderful. Oh, we're we're actually getting really close to that. And we're starting to like um, Dungeons and Dragons has a like a dungeon crawling board game that's totally age appropriate. So it's a great way to start it. Oh, that's awesome. It's like a dungeon crawl. And then there's just, I mean, tabletop games in general. I mean, there it's a there's so much there. If I'm I'm staring at my shelf uh, as I talk to you, and I've got Imperial Assault, which is a Star Wars based dungeon crawler from Fantasy Flight Games. I've got Mantic's Dungeon Saga, which is another dungeon crawler from a, a British company that's an answer to Warhammer Quest. And then I've got about thirty other <laughs> tabletop board games uh, right in my field of view. It's definitely a a lifelong passion of mine. In fact. Uh, I sold a Shadow Ops uh, war game based on my Shadow Ops universe no way. to Nocturnal. Yeah, I did um, to Nocturnal Media, which is a company that um, was founded by the guy who did White Wolf, which did the Vampire the Masquerade game, which was so successful. And uh, it was in development. They were sculpting the pieces, 
And unfortunately, the CEO of the company passed away suddenly, just one of those things, you know, uh, a freak uh, health issue that took his life. And with most gaming companies, they're, they're so small that, um, you know, there's really one creative visionary who's driving the, the, the company. So the project got scrapped. But I am, as of a week ago, in negotiations now with another company to possibly develop it again. So hopefully uh, I'll have some news about that in the new year. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, indeed. Oh, man, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, it was like, it was it was such a, I, look, I was, I was really sorry to lose the game. But, um, you know, look, this poor man had just passed away, leaving a family behind. I just was... You know, I said to the company, "Don't don't worry about the game. I mean, the game the game is the last thing on my mind right now. Worry about you know dealing with this this sudden and unexpected loss." It always freaks me out to hear about the sudden and unexpected losses, just because I mean, like, yeah, start, it's terrifying. Yeah, I mean, it's like I spend a lot of time worrying about death and being a fiction writer. You know, you you your brain is trained to think of yeah. fifteen different scenarios that can happen at one time. Yeah, and writers tend to catastrophize and be super anxious and think about the worst. Add to that the tension of being a, a new mother with uh, elementary school kids. You know, you're definitely set up to like for plenty of catastrophe and disaster scenarios to play uh, on repeat in your head. And the worst part is we're smart. So we're going to make those disaster scenarios as logical and as believable as humanly possible which prevents us from just waving our hands and going, ah, oh, that'll never happen. Yes, exactly. I know. I mean, and it's like, I'll be like in the car by myself driving home and it'll be raining out. And I'll be like, what if, you know, this car doesn't stop and then <laughs> right, you know, I'm right. home. And it's like, what are you doing to yourself? Like, Well, that's, it's the curse of being a smart and creative person. But look, if it helps, uh, I bet you all of your listeners, and if you were to post this, if you were to make a tweet out of this, everybody would be nodding. This is the this is the company you keep. It's certainly me. Yeah. Gosh, though, it's weird. Yeah, it's tough. Well, and I've been I've been making a point just because I've just been I've been juggling so much the last few months. I have been doing a lot of my work at home. And I have not been leaving my house as much as I should. So I've been making little goals for myself. So I'm like, oh, sunshine. Okay. When I was a full time writer, I, I had to do the same thing. I um, I was a full time writer for a couple of years before I. Uh, wound up getting back, uh, getting back uh, in a law enforcement. I yeah, it definitely impacted my mental health not having a structure. And I finally reached the point where I actually built myself a daily schedule. You know, had a spreadsheet, set an alarm. You're going to get up at this hour. You're going to go right from this hour to this hour. You can't do laundry whenever you want. You can't go shopping whenever you want. You can't meet friends whenever you want. And having that kind of um, set schedule, I didn't do that toward the until toward the end of the two years, and I did it as a response to feeling kind of listless and and drifting. Um, but when I did it, it really helped me when I was in those patches. Yeah, no, I have to stick to a schedule, and I need to make sure that I get like my yoga in, so I don't like eat my foot. <laughs> or yoga, but yoga yoga makes you flexible enough so that you can eat your foot should you want to. Which you know just makes me have to do more yoga. So it's like now I can reach my foot. So I need <laughs> yoga so I don't actually eat it. Perfect. <laughs> so what is it? How does it feel to finish the um, Shadow Ops series? Um, I mean, it's bittersweet. On the one hand, it's nice to have a break. Um, you know, I, well, there's a few reasons. One is it's nice to have a break because I've been tracking in the same mold for six novels in six years, right? Five years. Yeah. It's sad to leave it. It's sad to sort of close down that piece of my life. I mean, I guess I could theoretically sell more books in that vein, but I don't see, you know, at least in the foreseeable future that happening. I'm kind of moving in a different direction. And like, you know, that was kind of the thing I did. I, I always am hesitant to, to make, make this claim that that was my subgenre, the modern military fantasy, because I know that like someone's going to point out that someone else did it. But I kind of felt like that was the thing that, I came onto the scene to do initially and I did it. And now I'm kind of closing the door on it for a little while and moving on to something else. But it's also super exciting and super satisfying because one of the things that was really frustrating for me when I was, you know, the, the military writer, especially when I was still in service with the, with the buzz cut and everything was that every interview I was on would be, you know, when you get up in the military morning and have a military breakfast and take a military shower and, Go about your military day. What's that military experience like? And I was kind of like, you know, guys, the military is my job and it's an important part of my life. And I'm glad that 
you know, you feel that there's authenticity there, that that's making its way into my writing and that that's causing it to resonate for you. But I want you to like my writing because it's good, not because it's authentic. You know what I mean? I, I want my prose and my characters and my plotting to sing. And I want to believe that, that that's, that I have range and that I'm good enough of a writer outside of the gimmick of, hey, this guy's actually in the military and writing about the military. You know, I, I wanted to prove to myself that I was a writer. I always said with a capital W that I could really write, do anything. And so I set out to do, at the time it was called The Fractured Girl. We made it The Armored Saint with this exact express goal of spreading out further into fantasy and writing something else in a different vein. And I had a really hard time selling that book. Um, I was at it for about two or three years before I finally was able to find it a home and struggling and editing and trying to get this book to a point where I could get my voice to really come through. And, you know, of course I had that long, dark tea time of the soul to steal a, a title from Douglas Adams where I thought, man, wow, man, maybe, maybe I can't do this. Maybe I really am just a, a military fantasy writer. And if I try to do something else, I can't pull it off. So when I finally sold it and when that sale kind of generated so much attention and publicity and people seem really excited about it, and now we're getting closer and closer to the publication date, yeah, there's something super satisfying about, you know, it's like Babe Ruth pointing at the stands and being like, I'm going to hit the ball there. <laughs> and, then he, and then he does it. You know, that's an incredible feeling. And then um, I also sold my first nonfiction work. Um, I have a, a, a history book called Legion versus Phalanx, which is a deep dive on six battles between the Roman legion and the Greek. I'm doing air quotes with Greek here because they were actually Hellenistic, Balkan and Macedonian um, phalanx in the third and second centuries BC. It's a straight up history book that I'm publishing with this extremely illustration heavy imprint called Osprey. And any of your listeners who've grown up playing war games know about Osprey. They're a really great company. I certainly grew up with their work and, you know, I don't have a PhD. I've never been a professor, which is two major strikes against you when you're trying to sell nonfiction, academic nonfiction. And to have sold that book and that book will be coming out in the fall. You know, now I've really sort of proved at least to myself that, yeah, I can do lots of writing. It doesn't just have to be military fantasy. Yeah, for sure. The history book. That's really exciting. It's super exciting. And, and look, I'm, I'm very lucky. Um, I'm no fool. I understand that, being a, a gifted amateur, maybe not even a gifted amateur, but an enthusiastic amateur. Look, I can read the source material. I can teach myself Kini Greek and Latin. I can go to Greece and see the, and survey the battlefields. I can, um, you know, read the secondary scholarship and make sure I know this material. But that is no substitute for 30 years of professional experience as an academic doing this full time. And I was really, really lucky that I met Mike Livingston, who's an amazing fantasy author in his own right with Tor. Um, his uh, book, The Shards of Heaven, he has a, a, series, a trilogy with them, but The Shards of Heaven is definitely one of his books you should check out. Um, he has years of being a professor and a scholar, a warfare scholar, publishing in Medieval Warfare Magazine. We're co-writing. We published one article together in Ancient Warfare Magazine now, and we'll have three more coming out, and hopefully we'll be doing a book together. And out of no other reason than the goodness of his heart, because his focus was medieval uh, warfare, not ancient, although he's getting into ancient now, he liked me and he was willing to mentor me and go to Greece with me um, on his own dime to sort of help, you know, take me under his wing and make sure that I understood how scholarship gets done. And he brought along his good buddy, who's now my good buddy, Kelly DeVries, who is also um, a really celebrated medieval historian. And um, sort of the, the go-to guy for a lot of major television shows who bring them on to talk about, you know, arms and armor and, and siege engines and all that kind of stuff. So I was really, really lucky to have these two dedicated academic professionals willing to mentor me through the process. That's awesome. Yeah, I was really lucky. Well, and of course, my mind goes to how the, the like, the food. I'm so food focused right now. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that it's December and I, you know. Treat. I cannot. I can't eat salads in December. No, I, can't. I can't do it. I, can't. I need hot food. Mm -hmm. Although uh, in Greece, the food was amazing, of course. But basically, all you eat, or all I eat, uh, is I just ate feta cheese and cucumbers and tomatoes. That was my entire diet for nine days. Everything is covered in olive oil. You know, you you 
you order an ice cream and someone comes out and you know <laughs> puts a little of olive oil on it you know um but uh yeah man it was it was greece is really magical the mainland itself is as you know going through some really hard economic times um so it's it's a little uncomfortable seeing the mainland the islands of course are flush with tourist money the history it's just incredible you, you can't put a shovel in the ground without having to call in an archaeological survey team because it's all there and it's all still there and it's everywhere. It's, really? it's incredible. Yeah. What's, what's there? I mean, ev- ancient Greece, ancient Greece, Hellenistic Greece, um, you know, Roman sites, uh, Balkan sites all the way up through um, World War II. And it is everywhere. We went to Thermopylae, which is the hot gates that Leonidas defended against the Persians, which is the basis for the Frank Miller comic book 300. And later the film 300, we stood right where that fight happened. Oh, wow. Uh, most, most of the battlefields that I was interpreting are a little more obscure. People know less about them. But I sure am hoping uh, that, um, that this book will, will do something to change that. That's awesome. Yeah, it was a great trip. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, and also, too, I mean, like, you know, as a fiction writer, I get so much from nonfiction, you know, writing there's so much of that you know i spend hours researching and lost in holes and it's that's cool that you're contributing to to the nonfiction world as well that's like yeah hands, for sure and hands uh, in many yeah eyes. yeah for sure and of course that's that's like one of the best parts of being a writer is it gives you excuse to jump down all these nonfiction holes people always warn you not to get too caught up in the research and use that as an excuse not to write and they're right to give you that warning but the truth is that, like, that's kind of part of the fun of it. <laughs> Sometimes I have to, like, I I spent, I got lost in um, just all different mythologies for a while um, for the book that I'm working on. And I ended up setting a timer just so I didn't kill an entire day reading, you know, every mermaid story that I, I could find. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the job perks. I'd say that. And also being able to work in pajama pants. <laughs> I don't have that luxury. Well, when you're writing, you can wear pajama pants. <laughs> That's true, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can't, you know, you can't protect New York in pajama pants. No, you can't You can't go into one police plaza in pajama pants. You're going to get in a lot of trouble. Although, who knows? I got I, I got New Year's Eve duty, so uh, um, there probably won't be that many people around. So. Oh, do you? I'm kidding. Yeah, oh yeah, I try very hard. I um I'm one, I really like um I always feel uncomfortable holidays, right? Holidays I always feel like I'm under pressure to go to parties or I'm under pressure to you know, you must have fun. And as you know, Jamie, I'm I'm really against fun and joy and any of that stuff. So uh, and I'm lucky that the other two guys on my squad have families and uh, so it's the perfect excuse, you know. Any kind there's a major holiday. When I was still in the Coast Guard, it was great because there was always a need for patrol, um, especially on holidays. That's when people go out in boats and do stupid things. Um, but now, um, you know, I, I'm, I always do try to pick up shifts and, and I always hate New Year's Eve when there's this pressure to, what party are you going to? Well, I'm not going to any party. I got to work. Totally. No, I got to say the New Year's, I, that is one thing that um, – my kids have made New Year's into just a movie marathon and eat tons of, you know, goodies because it's New Year's Eve. And I love yeah. it. Yeah, that sounds like a blast. Um, but uh, working on New Year's Eve, I'd imagine you deal with some crazy stuff. Well, I mean, you got to remember that I'm in a, uh, I'm in a cyber unit. So uh, oh, okay. it, I mean, we sometimes do, but, um, but it's, it's certainly not as crazy as what the guys who are stuck out in Times Square have to deal okay. with. Okay. Yeah. I don't think I realized that, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. No, this time of year always makes me miss New York. I, you know, I grew up in North Jersey and New York was like a big part of my holiday, you know, traditions. I had an aunt that had an apartment in the Upper East Side. So we would, you know, see the Thanksgiving parade, do the ball drop and all that stuff. And yeah, man. I, it's funny. It, it's grass is always greener. Like I'm dreaming of Seattle. <laughs> every time I, every time I go to a con, I have fantasies of living in that city. I, I, I do Phoenix comic con. I want to move to Arizona. You know, I do, uh, I do uh, Emerald city comic con. I want to move to Seattle. Yeah. Well, no, this time of year in particular, I mean, you know, there is really not much more magical than a snow covered New York. 
And I mean, when, yeah. it, when it first comes down, not when it gets all gross. I was about to say, because it, it, it's a, New York is gorgeous and snow covered for all of 30 seconds. And then all that snow turns black. <laughs> yeah. But the moment when it's quiet and it's covered in snow is gorgeous. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But yeah, no, Christmas holidays make me miss New York. And when I want a decent slice of pizza or bread or a bagel, <laughs> I don't have any of that here. Yep. We have pizza and bagels, just not real good ones. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell anybody from Chicago that they'll freak out on you and tell you that they have the best pizza. But we know the truth of that, don't we? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, my my dad's side came, you know, my dad's parents came over from Sicily when they were in their 20s. And, and they had a couple of pizza shops. And um, so we would get, you know, such good pizza for like, you know, just send it on home. And we would just have all this pizza in the fridge. So <laughs> sounds awesome. <laughs> and I'm talking about food again, I guess, <laughs> close to my dinner time. That's right. But yes, um, 2017 is coming to an end and I'm really excited about it. And um, back to the whole, you know, optimism around the new year. I feel like 2018 is going to be better. I mean, I have no way to know. I mean, no way to One know, the- but I can hope. Yeah, we can all hope. 2017, I think, really kind of convinced me that I don't know anything <laughs> and that um, and that whatever it is I thought, you know, up was up and down was down and right was right and wrong was wrong. All of that has been thrown into question. So what's really cool about that is it, it enables me to focus less on existential things and more about what's right in front of my face and what I can do right now. So, um, you know, we've had some good news toward the end of 2017, I think. And I think, you know, depending on where you sit, some bad news uh, over the last couple of days. But um, uh, I know what I have to do and what I have to do doesn't change. You know, I have to I have to do my job and I have to keep New York safe. I have to make great art, as uh, Neil Gaiman said in his awesome speech, I think, to the Philadelphia School of the Arts, I think, was when he made that commencement speech. Um, and those are simple things. And those are things I think I know how to do, or at least know how to try to do. And in 2018, um, well, here, I'll make my new year's resolution now oh. in 2018, in 2018, I'm going to redouble my efforts to, to do those things the best I can. Nice work. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we won't do a whole 2017 recap, but I would, will say that stranger things too, was a good part of 2017. It was a good part of 2017. Um, I'm about nine episodes into The Punisher, and uh, I am uh, I think I'm going to probably fall down on the side of that is not a good thing about 2017. Really? I'm having a tough time. Yeah, I'm having a tough time enjoying it. Oh, no. I'm on ep- – so I just – I'm, I'm on episode uh, two. Oh, well. All right. Well, I should – we should not discuss this then. <laughs> but I did like the first episode – I will. Oh, we, we, we'll, we'll reconvene oh, and, and, uh, and catch up on us. But yes, but Stranger Things 2 was a great time. Um, maybe not as magical as Stranger Things 1 for me, but some of that was the novelty uh, having worn off. But yeah, they, they, they definitely hit all the high notes on that one. The story during this, you know, the second season just felt more like it was happening while everybody's lives were going on and not everyone stopped because they're looking for Will. And mm. that part of it, I found extra immersive for me. I felt more mm. like closer to the characters. Yeah. And of course, Sean Astin, you know, kind of. Oh, my God. I mean, we all, you know, we all knew it was going to happen, but I, he, he really does. I uh, didn't. Oh, man, I did. I did from the second he showed up. <laughs> yeah, I guess I just didn't think about that. Because it's too heart wrenching to consider. Yeah. And it was heart wrenching. <laughs> well, and actually, because I, I watched all I watched through the second season and then. um rewatched it from the beginning first season with my daughter because she was like okay cause she was hearing about it at school and figured she was old enough to watch it and um she loved bob and she was so upset <laughs> wonderful did you see the new star wars yet no i have not we are um, we are waiting until the kids are um on holiday break and then we're gonna go okay cool well it sounds i haven't seen it either and i'm I'm not one of these spoilers. People get so upset about spoilers. I just, I really don't care. I, I uh, you, you, knowing what happens doesn't really spoil a story for me. Not that I'm asking people to call me up or give me information, but I'm not like 
people are going through such dramatic efforts to make sure that absolutely no information about the movie comes across their social media, or they're going to see it immediately uh, in an effort to like head head it off at the past, the possibility of any spoilers. I just, I don't have that kind of reaction. No, I mean, I'm going to, I just, I personally, I'm just not going to deal with the opening crowds. It gets, I mean, it's so packed where we are. It's great. Yeah. So like, well, in New York, I mean, we're gonna, we're not quite as packed as you guys are. Although <laughs> the secret's up about how awesome the city is. I can't even, it has grown so much in the last six years. It's nuts. Yeah. I mean, it, it really has. Uh, every time I go, it gets a little more crazy. And, and uh, like I said, I've got some friends in, in the police department over there who, you know, their jobs all get more interesting with each passing year. Oh, I bet. I bet they have their hands full depending on where they're located. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Now every time I leave the house, it feels like, uh, you know, rush hour. Yeah, for sure. And I will say this because I am born and raised North Jersey, mall country, and I'm the the driving there is crazy. But it is crazier here. I am in Seattle. Yes. I can't imagine that. It, the New York? No, not the not New York. Northern Jersey. Oh, all right. Well, maybe. Who knows? Uh, as a as a dyed in the wool New Yorker, you know, Jersey is a foreign country. Might as well go to the moon. All you know, right. I don't ever go all there. All right. <laughs> Painful flashbacks. Oh man. Well, you know, bridge and tunnel people. You know how it is. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Dirty Jersey. That's right. <laughs> um. Well, Mike, can you tell everybody where they can they can find you? Yeah, sure. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Mike Cole, M-Y-K-E-C-O-L-E. I spell Mike with a Y. If you want to follow me on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash Mike Cole. I do maintain a website, MikeCole.com, though in this day and age, do people use or go to websites anymore? I don't, I don't think they do. I think it's mostly uh, social media these days. Huh. Um, you can always email me at Mike at MikeCole.com, and I respond to all of my emails, and I hope folks will... Uh, Check out Siege Line, which just came out October 31st in the Armored Saint when it comes out in February. Awesome. I am so excited for the Armored Saint. I, I really, I'm stuck. Cool. I hope you like it. I'm, I'm excited to see what people think. So far, the, the, the pre-read reviews that have been coming out have been pretty good. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited. And uh, that wraps it up for, for this week and for this year. <laughs> Goodbye, 2017. <laughs> yep. Sayonara. No, I don't think I can pull that off. Yeah, don't come back. <laughs> um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter at me Bettingfield and follow the show at Too Many Words Pod. And uh, you can go to my site um, and for reviews and words at tmwpod.com and go to Patreon and uh, support the show. Happy New Year. And uh, I'll talk to you next year. Thanks so much, Mike, for coming on. 